Awesome. So it looks like we're ready to go. Hi, my name is Michael Jackson. I'm a California native. Um, lived in Utah for a few years. I'm living in California again. I'm working for Twitter.com currently. How many people know t what Twitter is? <laughs> All right, a few of you. That's good. How many people use Twitter? How many people are using Twitter right now? Awesome. Yeah, it feels really good to work for, uh, work for Twitter because obviously you get to work on something that people use every day, so that's a lot of fun. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, big thanks to them for sponsoring me to come on out here. We are looking for Ruby peeps. If the Bay Area appeals to you, come and talk to me. Um, so a couple of days ago, uh, I saw this question come up on Hacker News, right? Some, some guy is like, do you test your code? And uh, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an ambiguous question, I guess, because there's a lot of different levels of testing. So he broke it down. He said, let's have a poll. He said, there's, there's three different levels, right? Uh, yeah, I test. I'm pretty comfortable with my tests. No, I, well, yeah, you know, we write some tests, but we probably should be writing more. And man, who needs tests, right? The shoot from the hip cowboy coder types. Um, so, you know, what do you, what do you think the results were? So about 9% of the respondents are like, forget tests, we don't care. Uh, about 23% of them, so almost one in four, said, yeah, we've got good tests. We really like our tests. And then there's this massive group that said, yeah, we'd like to do more testing, but, you know, it's just too much overhead. And so I thought, hmm, overhead. What are, they, what are they talking about overhead? What, what does overhead mean, right? It's kind of a loaded term when you're talking about, about testing. Um, think about it for a second. Are you in that group, that 69%? What, what is the overhead that prevents you from writing as many tests as you would like to be writing, right? Because chances are there are a few people in this room, given the percentage, who fit into that category. What is it? Uh, as I thought about it, I could think of like four different kinds of overhead, right? You've got the sort of initial like, okay, guys, let's test. We're going to bite the bullet. We're going to take a couple hours and like figure this stuff out, right? We're going to like set up a testing environment and a rake task that's going to run our tests. And maybe we'll, if we're fancy, we'll have like a, a, you know, a build server that's like running the builds. And if we're really fancy, we'll program a traffic light over here to glow red when the build fails. I mean, you can go to all sorts of levels of complexity there. Uh, the second step is obviously writing your tests. Sometimes this is going to require you to actually go back through your code and change it because you learn when you try and test your code, you're like, I don't know how to get in there because it's kind of a black box. And that's a red flag that says, hey, man, your code kind of needs to be refactored so you can actually test it. Uh, there's a, th a third thing, which is uh, running your tests. Now, this thing isn't obviously something that happens once. So the, the second and third thing actually happen continuously all the time. You write some code. You write some tests. You run the tests. You run the tests. Hopefully, before you do a commit, maybe you run it automatically in your, your pre-commit hook. Uh, and then as your code changes, you refactor the tests. Uh, so there's, there's this overhead, right? And this is kind of the, what, I, what I deemed to be kind of the necessary overhead when you're writing tests, right? And, and there's this massive group of people that say that this is too much for them, right? This is too much. We'd like to be writing more tests, but this, the overhead is too much. Something over here is too much for them. Leads me to a Dijkstra quote. You know, I hope that 10 years after that I'm dead, people are going to be like, yeah, Michael Jackson once said. <laughs> because we already said, we already quoted this guy today. He's pretty awesome. So he's a, he's, a, he's a good authority, and he's a heck of a lot better authority than I am on this topic. He said that simplicity is a prerequisite for reliability, okay? If you want any part of your code base to be reliable, it's your tests, right? Because it really sucks to be like, oh, my code is broken. Oh, I'm going to write some tests. Oh, crap. Now my tests, like, are my tests broken? Or is it, is it my code that's broken that the test is telling me that the code is broken? Or is it the test that's broken? You want your tests to be reliable, right? Dijkstra is telling us, uh, in, if, you want your, if you want reliable code, it needs to be simple code. 
How many people here saw a talk that Rich Hickey gave, probably like back in October, November, called Simple Made Easy? Please tell me you watched that talk. Get your hands up. Get out of this room right now and go watch that talk. Rich Hickey, uh, he, he, he was talking about the difference between simple and complex and easy and, uh, and difficult, right? And that simple and easy are not at all the same thing, right? You're, you are a human, okay? You have this brain, right? Dave Brady knows a lot more about the brain than I do, but it's brain and it's got sort of this limited capacity, right? Uh, to, to think about things, right? And as the complexity of your project grows, your ability to hold that in your head and think about it and consider it at one time diminishes, okay? As the complexity grows, your ability to understand diminishes, okay? Unless you're just like super smart, which I'm sure there are a few of you here who, and I hate you. Uh, so I, I would like to suggest that this, this complexity is actually a multiple, it's, it's a multiplying factor on this overhead, right? So we talked about this overhead. We've got, we have to write our tests. We have to set up our testing environment. We have to run our tests. We have to uh, refactor our tests. The more complex our test suite is, the more that costs, okay? Ask yourself, for example, just say, uh, if somebody new comes into my company, right? We give them a shiny new computer and we say, welcome to the company. First thing, we want you to check out the repo, right? Second thing, we want you to run the tests. How long is that gonna take him? I'll tell you, at a company where I worked, I had to install two different versions of Ruby, not joking, Okay, because we were using JRuby to boot up this thing called HTML unit so Capybara could talk to HTML unit, which, by the way, who in their right minds browses the web with HTML unit? Nobody. So how effective is that test? Really, not very effective. Um, and anyway, on top of all that mess, we had uh, you know, RSpec. We, we, we had the works. It took me literally a couple of hours to get this all up and running. How well do you think I understood my testing stack once I actually got it up and running? No, I didn't understand it at all. I thought, I, 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 had, came, I had come from this world that where I was like writing little you know, unit tests. I was like, def test this. And I wrote the test and, and it passed and that was great. But it, as a result, there were a, a lot of you know, WTS, what is going on here, right? The testing thing broke again. Oh yeah, I forgot to boot that other thing that needs to run over here, right? Something else you need to think about is how long it takes to run your tests, okay? At Twitter right now, this is kind of an interesting fun fact, we have kind of a big code base, right? We actually have to farm out our tests to like this fleet of servers that like runs on this network and runs them all in parallel. I was talking to a guy, uh, to Mike, actually, from Living Social last night. He's like, yeah, he's like, that happens with, uh, you know, you got a big code base, that's what happens. I'm not saying that's like a bad thing. It seems to be a necessary evil with a large company. But if you're small, like, you need to think about that. How, how long is it taking to run your tests, right? We made some concessions because it was taking us a long time. So, so I want to talk, uh, I, I'm... <laughs> Basically, the, the premise of my talk today is that we should be using tools that trim down on this complexity as much as we possibly can, okay? We should be writing awesome tests, okay? We should be writing tests where I feel good about it, right? One of the, one of the coolest things that I've learned by coming to, uh, you know, the UREG meetups and coming out here to MWRC every year and talking with the Rubyists out here is that uh, your code is, it's a manifestation of you, right? You need to feel good about your code, right? If there's some disparity there, right? And some people can word this a lot better than I can, but if, if there's not, um, if you don't like it, right? It's not going to be good code. Um, I call awesome tests simple tests because unlike Gary, I am a simple man, okay? I'm not, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I write a little bit of code, but uh, at the end of the day, 
I can only hold so much in my head. I need it to be very, I need to be as simple as possible. So I want to talk today about a tool called Minitest. Minitest comes out of a, a, a group up in uh, Seattle. There are a bunch of Rubyists up there, and they're sometimes hostile towards other people who don't see things exactly the same way as they do. Nevertheless, this little gem came out of the, um, the group up there, and uh, it's called Minitest, written by Ryan Davis. Um, it ships with Ruby 1.9. So um, basically, it's just like a drop-in replacement for test unit. So if you've been using test unit, you can basically, uh, you, can, you can either gem install this on Ruby 1.8, or if you're on 1.9, you, you just require your, you, the same way as you've always done, and you'll get mini test unit instead. Um, so already, that's something that's going for it. It's, it's trimming down on the complexity, right? I don't have to install something special. Um, it's a lot less code than you're used to with your normal testing frameworks, right? Our spec is a lot of lines of code, right? There's a lot of complexity there, right? Um, mini test, you can crack open the whole thing, you can read it in an afternoon, right? I'm not saying that needs to bother you, okay? That our spec has, you know, thousands of lines of code more than mini test. It bothers me, okay? So this is the choice that I make, right? I like to read through and understand every piece of code that I'm, that I'm using in my system. If you're like me, I think you'll like Minitest. Um, Minitest, the cool thing about it is it actually supports a lot of different styles of testing. So I know I said it's a drop-in replacement for test unit, right? So you can write your unit tests. Uh, you know, they'll look just like your test unit tests are. You say, def test something. In this case, I'm like testing some web app, right? This is like the, uh, this is like the rack test. Uh, 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 syntax here, I say like get slash, and I assert that the last response was okay. Uh, you can write uh, spec style tests. So you can describe something, right? And you can say, I'm describing this app. I'm describing, you know, in other words, when you get slash, it should be oh, an okay response, right? And then you've got this nice like chained Last response dot status dot must equal 200. That, that's useful for everybody who gets confused as to the order of the arguments when they say assert equal. Now, was it expected or actual first or last? So it makes it doubly confusing for me because I use Node a lot. And uh, sorry, Tony, I, sometimes I use Node. But anyway, uh, they, the guys who wrote like the Node assertions like reversed them. So now <laughs> it's really difficult for me. No wonder I'm such a mess. Mocks, it supports mocking, right? It's got this nice little mocking library, it's very simple. You got a mock object, it's got a method called expect, right? You say, when I call this method on you, you're gonna expect this. Either you're gonna expect a specific type of argument, like uh, here in, in this first example, I want you to expect a, a something that's a string, right? So when I say it uses any string, it's true. I say, say mock.verify and it doesn't blow up on me. Um, Either that, or, or I could say, I want you to expect this exact argument, right? And then I call mock.verify, it doesn't blow up on me, it returns true. Okay, so what does this look like to actually run these tests? Uh, so we say rake spec, and there, there are kind of a couple of cool things here in the output, actually. First thing that you'll notice is it says run options. You're like, where did that come from? Uh, so one nice thing about mini tests is it will automatically run your test, your entire test suite, in a completely random order, right? You've got all these tests. They're supposed to be independent of one another, right? They're supposed to be, they're not supposed to depend on running in a certain order. And so what uh, mini test does is it will seed the random number generator in Ruby with some value, and then it'll use that to, to determine the, the order in which it runs your test. So if you are running your tests one day with mini test and you see this weird thing, you're like, oh crap, it blew up. But it's never blown up before. And then you like run it again and it passes and you run it again and it passes. Well, you know you've got like an order dependent test. So what you can do is you can take that seed that came out of there and you can precede the, uh, the random number generator with that, with that seed to, so you can catch that specific bug again and hopefully eliminate it. Uh, those are the worst kinds of bugs, by the way. <laughs> Um, so anyway, you run your test, you get a dot, dot, dot. Oh, it came out good. I can see, you know, how much time it took, uh, how many assertions I'm making per second. That's kind of cool. How many tests I'm running per second. And then the summary, you did this many tests, this many assertions, you skipped this many. Uh, so yeah, skipping, you can do something like this. You can just 
You can just, you know, you've got this broken assertion here, right? And you're like, eh, I don't know about this, but I still want to run the rest of the tests. So I could say, just skip this one for now. Um, verbosity, so you can, get, you can get like much more verbose output. You can see, for example, like how long each of your tests took in the output when you run it with this option. Um, you can even do cool little things like benchmarking. So you'll, you'll uh, if you want to, um, so this doesn't come up very much in my code, but sometimes people might be doing things like academic research, things where they need to, uh, you know, make sure that a certain piece of code always fits a certain performance profile, and they have, you know, various uh, profiles that you can run your code against to make sure that it, it, it's always got the same fit. So without further ado, I'm halfway in, and I want to jump into some code, and we're not coming back to the slides until like the very end. So here we go. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Bonk. Ten minutes. He's like, you're not halfway in, dude. You're like psh, way more than halfway. Dude. All right. Oi. I'm having fun. Funky time with this thing. All right, so let's check out let's check out my app. Okay, so I've got this uh, I've got this sample code that I uh, that I linked to earlier, um, and right now I just want to focus on this this side directory. Right. So <clears throat> as I was talking with one of my colleagues, he was like he's like you know man like some sometimes the thing is like people just don't know how to get like set up and like going with this stuff. They're like, yeah, man, I hear you. Testing is cool. I hear you. I want to test my stuff. And then you show like a couple of pithy examples like I did earlier. And it's like, yeah, I, I see that, but uh, rewind a little bit and help me get started. So I'm just going to breeze through this, right? So we've got, uh, we've got our little rake file here, right? Man, I wish I had more space. Let's see. View. Hide the project drawer. And open it up. Okay. How's that? <laughs> are you are you okay over there? Okay. All right. So uh, so here's what my rake file looks like. Okay. I put this code out on GitHub so that anybody who wants to get started with this can like get up and go. So this this app this repo is just a little web app, right? I've got two different types of tests. I've got specs and I've got unit tests, right? I just wanted to show both styles, right? In either case, my test runner is rake, right? Everybody's got rake. I can, uh, I've got these tasks uh, that I can just say, uh, you know, run some tests. And, you know, for example, when I, uh, for example, if I were at the command line, I could say something like uh, rake, oop, test, right? Rake, spec, run these tests. Um, I need that project drawer, though. I need to get to the other files. Okay, that's, that's good. Okay, so let's dive in. Let's check out, for example, uh, just some uh, a unit test, right? So I've got this app test thing. Um, basically, what I'm doing is I'm requiring a, a, a helper file, right? That's the first thing that's going on in this, this test. So I'm going to see, okay, what, what's in the helper file? Um, since it's a rack app, I'm setting the rack environment to test. It's something you always want to do. You make sure you don't hose your production or development data or whatever. Send out a bunch of emails to your clients, which would be really embarrassing. Um, put the lib on the load path and require mini test auto run. Easy peasy. Your tests run, right? When you, when you require mini test auto run. Okay, so let's go back to the test. So we know that's, what, that's what's kind of bootstrapping it. So this particular test, we, we're requiring rack test. It's just a basic uh, basic, uh, you know, rack app test. We're extending our, our mini unit test case, or mini test to unit test case. Rack test wants us to have one method called app, which it determines to, uh, which, you know, is how it figures out who to send the calls to. And then we've got this method called test home, get slash and assert the response is okay. Okay? It's literally that easy to get up and running with uh, mini tests in your web app. By the way, let's go check out the web app. Uh, here in my lib app folder. It's a little Sinatra app hanging out in here, saying welcome home. It's kind of nice. Um, but then you're like, no, dude, def test. What, what is that? I want to describe this thing. Okay, we'll describe it. So uh, let's require, um, ooh, here comes some secret sauce. Sinatra spec. We'll get back to that. 
describe my app, describe get slash, it should respond okay, get slash, and then I'll just say, we saw this example earlier, right? The last response needs to have a, a 200 status. So what is this Sinatra spec business going on here? I included this example. This is, a, this is an example that is just supposed to show you some things that I've been doing with, um, with Sinatra and mini tests, right? So I, I made this gist the other day. I put it up here and I was like, hey, I can write specs for my Sinatra apps really easily, right? I don't need like somebody to do this for me, right? What does Minitest do? Minitest has a method called register spec type, right? Basically what that means is I want you to use this spec class if this block, when given this desk, returns true, okay? So, when, so let's head back to my app, right? My app spec. I say describe app, right? This is the desk, okay? This is just a class. This is the desk that we're looking at here, okay? So mini test spec is gonna say, hmm, I wonder what spec class I should use for that. Oh, I've got this desk thing. I'll pass it to that lambda and, or that block and, and see, see if, if, uh, if I should use Sinatra spec for it or not. Sure enough, Sinatra spec says, is that a base? In other words, is that a Sinatra base? That's all it is. Is that, is that a class that like subclasses Sinatra base? If so, use the Sinatra spec. Sure enough, we saw that, uh, that that class indeed does subclass Sinatra spec, so we're like, okay, good to go. We're using, the, we're using our Sinatra spec for this thing. That's kind of a cool feature of, of, uh, of Minitest is that ability to register or, uh, uh, custom spec classes for the different types of specs you want to run. Again, we, uh, we're including rack test methods because we like the rack test methods. It just gives us all that get post goodness. Um, and rack test wants this app method, right? This app method just basically goes up the, up the inheritance hierarchy to find this. This is our app class. And it says, what is the app? It's a new one of those. Okay? That's all it is. It's very simple. So now I head back to my spec. So I mean, this was like super easy, right? I got into Minitest. I understood exactly what was going on, right? The, the Minitest spec file is literally about 100 lines of code. It's like 200 with really good comments. It's so easy to understand. And it's very little overhead getting in there and understanding exactly how it works, right? So when I head back to this thing, I'm like, oh yeah. I understand what's going on here. How many people understand exactly what's going on here? Right? You could get it uh, if you just sat down with it for 15 minutes. And that's why I put the source of the, uh, of the file out there on, on GitHub. Anyway, I want to go to a, 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 I go to a little bit more advanced example. I want to go to something that, uh, no, don't save that. Five minutes. Okay, so I've got this fetcher thing. I'm gonna move really fast, you ready? I've got this fetcher thing. What, is it, what does a fetcher do? A fetcher goes and fetches URLs, right? What's it got? It's got this complex method called, called fetch, right? I'm just gonna open up these all at once because uh, cause I don't wanna deal with that project drawer anymore, okay? So what does this fetcher do? It's just, a, it's just an HTTP client, right? It's, it goes and fetches a whole bunch of new URLs. It, it does them all asynchronously. It spawns new threads and fetches the URLs and, and then uh, calls this callback with the results, right, with the body and with the URL, right? So I'm like, okay, I want to test this thing. I'm going to describe a fetcher. Uh, before it, before I run any tests, before I run all my tests, I'm going to say a fetcher is a new fetcher. Got a bunch of URLs. I'm going to say, uh, when requesting some URLs, it calls the callback for each URL. Keep a count of how many it's actually, uh, actually, how many times it's actually calling that callback. Count must equal URLs.size, right? Really easy. There's a problem with this test. I'm actually making a network request for every single fetch that I do, right? Even though I'm doing them all like in parallel, it still sucks because it takes time and I can't run these tests when I'm on the train to work because uh, I don't have a network connection, right? So let's. Let's make, a, let's make a stub. So some of you are thinking like, I know what you need. You need fake web. That's what you need, right? No, I don't really need fake web. I just need like a def, right? <laughs> def 
So okay, I'll, okay, so I'll say I've, I'll, I'll change my before block. Fetcher is a new fetcher. And look, I, I, can, I can stub it out right here. And I can curl that stuff. I'm, in, I'm basically ignoring all of the complex threading logic and things that I have. And I'm basically stubbing this out and replacing it with a call to curl, right? Um, but that's still not good enough. I'm still making a network request, right, each time I run that test. And, and so some of you might think, well, you need like a gem like VCR, or you need like something that's gonna like monkey patch, net HTTP, and, or, or whatever you're using, or patron, and then you would have a cool test. Well, no, I don't really need that. Like, can I just serialize a hash to disk, right? Can I just require YAML and say, okay, I've got a cache file that exists on disk somewhere. When I boot up, um, if that file exists, load that file, otherwise my cache is just a new hash. And then when in my stub, I can just say uh, or equals, right? The cache of that URL or equals curl it, call that call with, with the result, right? So I haven't introduced any extra dependencies, no extra dependencies, no added complexity. It took me about five minutes, and these tests are infinitely faster because they don't, they're not making any network requests. Cool thing about this is I understand exactly how it works. I can add a new URL to that, and what's it gonna do? First time I ever run that test, I better have a network connection because it's gonna go out and hit the network. It's gonna go fetch that URL. Every subsequent time I run that test, it's not gonna hit the network connection. I've got this YAML file. It's like a big serialized hash. I put that in my repo. I can run the tests on the train happily for this thing that's supposedly making network requests, right? Point is, and I'm, I'm finishing up, Mike, I promise. Point is, you don't need the complexity, okay, of testing frameworks. These, like, big testing frameworks. You need one thing. You need one way to make assertions. You need one way to get some readable output, right? Something that you like, right? And then it's up to you to go from there to build your tests, right? If it gets to the point where you're like, man, I don't even know what HTTP calls I'm making. I need to use fake web because something might hit the network and I don't even know how to stub that out. If, that, if your point ever gets, if your code ever gets to that point, I would suggest you've got bigger problems, right? Um, are there any questions? Yeah. And everyone seems to kind of have like their own opinion about it. Yep. Um, how do you introduce something like this, like, you know, to a bunch of people who are really interested in RSpec and like the uh, helpers and all the you know, tooling that it provides? Yeah. Uh, I, honestly, I can't say, I can't speak. He says uh, every organization has their own, own philosophy, right, about testing. So if you work with a bunch of guys who like, who love the big complex testing stack, like how do you go this way, right? Um, and it's, I, I haven't been very successful with this, I have to be honest. The, the only thing that I've found that works is to write some code. Um, if you're lucky enough to be in an organization where code speaks louder than like, let's sit around a whiteboard and hum and haw about this and like decide, I don't know, does this look better than, if you can write some code and, and walk into a room and say, look, I wrote some unit tests, your stuff's broke. <laughs> you know, that commit that you made last night when you were like drinking at 10 p.m., yeah, broke some stuff. And uh, I've got the unit tests that are like failing. Could we, could we fix this, you know? Put up a CI server, you know, put up a, put up a build server. And, and your company's like, well, we're not gonna provision that. You're like, Psh, I don't need you guys to provision it. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get my own server, you know? Like it's, I'll run out on Travis CI, you know? Like I'll, I'll run this stuff. And I'll let you guys know when the build is broken. And then we need to, you know what I'm saying? I, people in this room probably have very different opinions about that, but it's my opinion that writing code should win. Hopefully you're at that kind of an organization. Mike. So we have an app that's got greedy tests, has this uh, normal, as a app, so the normal test unit has yeah. and then RSpec tests. Yeah. And they go, uh, they perform in like exponential. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And that speaks loudly to developers, right? If you're like, dude, you're sick of waiting around for the tests? Like, let's refactor some of this stuff. Let's get it faster. Let's speed it up. Using simple stuff, simple techniques, right? We don't need to add more complexity. And so then when we run the tests and like there's some like, you know, 100 long, long backtrace and nobody knows what the heck is going on anymore. Any other questions? One more. Who's the lucky one? Right there. Uh, so kind of seen, and maybe this is just for purposes of demonstration, so you can totally do sure. this if you want to. Sure. Um, but when, you're, when you stub out, and I, I thought it was an awesome presentation, tons of great ideas, but when you stub out the, uh, the, fetcher. the fetch method, it kind of seemed like that's, the, that's what the fetcher does, it's fetched in. So you're basically yeah. not testing fetcher, you're testing your stuff. No, that's a good point. I meant to say, what if something else is using the fetcher, right? What if there's some higher level component, right? Some other object is talking to the fetcher. Say you've got like something that's supposed to do something with that result, right? Which is what you would be writing your test for, right? So somebody takes the result of this URL and maybe they parse the HTML and they grab for whatever, images or something. Maybe you're Pinterest and you're writing a URL scraper. And so you want to, in order to like make the, the fetcher like not be your bottleneck, right? You would, you would employ that kind of strategy. But no, you're absolutely right. That was, that was a bad example. I should be back to that example. Okay, like I said, I'm from Twitter. My name is Michael Jackson. This is my handle. You can uh, contact me there and I'd love to see you maybe later uh, this evening at the uh, address. Thank you.